Hello. I'm Paul Moffat. I'm Jan Moffat. And this is Clockworks, a three-season podcast. What? That's right. Legion has been renewed for a third season. And so, presumably, so have we. I guess so. I guess that that makes us commit to doing this for one more year. Right? Yeah. We honestly never really had any doubts about a third season of Legion, right? Not really. Mostly because we had that interview with Jeff Russo, and he was like, there's a plan for three seasons. And so I was just like, I assume that there'll be three seasons. And I guess FX could have canceled, and people are excited, and I'm excited, super excited that it's renewed. But I was just, I was mostly like, yeah, it was, it was going to be renewed. FX has just seemed very supportive of Noah Hawley Mm -hmm. and his stuff. Like even Fargo had had three seasons and FX is willing to do another one if he has an idea, which apparently he does. I've heard a rumor of that. Yeah, I think he now does. Yeah. But like, so it could very well be, I don't know what the ratings on Fargo are, but like they want to keep Noah Hawley happy. Mm -hmm. He wants to do three seasons of Legion. Yep. I'm not too surprised that they're doing one. I'll be a little surprised, or not surprised. Season four of Legion is where there's a question mark. Yes, absolutely. But regardless of whether we're surprised or not, it's good news and we're really happy about it. Woohoo! Three seasons of Legion. So this week we're talking about Legion chapter 17, which we're giving the title Cornflake Girl. This episode is written by Noah Hawley and Nathaniel Halpern and directed by Noah Hawley. Nathaniel Halpern is credited as a co-writer on most of the episodes of this season. I'm not going to say more about him than what I've already said early in this season. Uh, Noah Hawley, of course, is the creator of the show. As a writer, he's a credited writer on every episode this season. This is his first episode with a director's credit this season, and he only has one previous episode with a director's credit of Legion, and it's the pilot. So the writing of this episode is the main team of this season. Mm -hmm. And the directing, this is the one that Noah Hawley chose to direct. I assume he gets his choice, right? I assume that if he directs an episode, it's because it's the one that he wanted to direct. I assume, yeah. So that's just a kind of a thought to, as you go through this episode, that if he could pick one, he picked this one. Unless this is the extra episode. Unless this is the extra episode. We know that they got an extra episode, and I wonder whether everything in it was already filmed. They just had more. And so it's directed by Noah Hawley in the sense that he put it together. See, this is a thing. um, We've talked about this slightly on mic and slightly off, and people are talking about it all over, right? That Mm -hmm. Legion was slated to have 10 episodes, and then it was like, oh, actually, there's going to be 11 at the last minute. And the thing that I can't get over, though, about that is credit. Because the unions and guilds are strict about credit. Oh, that's true. He can't, Noah Hawley can't take an episode directed by someone else, splice it together, and put his name as the director on it. The guilds won't allow that. That's true. Unless he directed two episodes. Do we know if he directed the next episode? This is his only one this season with his name on it. Okay. As the director. So then who knows? So then who knows, right? Yeah. But I think, I feel actually quite sure that it isn't just spliced together. Whatever the extra episode is, it isn't spliced together odds and ends from other episodes. Mm -hmm. Even if, like, we believe that the editors are skilled enough to do that, the Director's Guild just wouldn't allow them to do that and put the director's name not being the director of those segments. like Yeah, that's a good point. I just don't think that would be allowed. All right, should we get into the episode itself? Let's. All right, chapter 17, let's go. So we open at the moment when Melanie emerges from her room to hit Clark over the head. She begins to drag him away, and then we flash back to 13 days earlier. Melanie does drugs in her room and paces around, and then we see her conversation with Sid from Chapter 9, talking about David being back and the sadness of the words vacant lot. She sleeps, and then Oliver comes to see her. She at first pulls a gun on him, 
But then he shows her a younger version of herself in the mirror, and she ends up kissing him. A younger version of Melanie dives into a pool, the same pool that we've seen before. She sits next to Farouk, who talks about the monk, and asks if he is at Division 3. On the other side of the pool, Oliver toasts her with his martini. Then Melanie climbs into a frozen room where her younger self sits with Oliver in the diving suit. She speaks with Oliver, and he tells her that she should have burned him, and that she could have tagged along. She then wakes in her own room. Again, Melanie paces in her room. She tries to eat an apple and pretty much fails at it. Carrie appears and asks when she's coming back to work. They then discuss whether Carrie is real, that whether male Carrie is real, and she says reality is a choice, and then says how nice it must have been for Oliver to be in an ice cube. She is convinced the world is in her head. Well, all right then. (laughs) So this whole first segment is Melanie Melanie. This is like, when it first started, I was like, oh, this is like the Melanie B-side episode. And it isn't entirely, like it goes between different characters, but this first half, first bit is all Melanie. Yeah, and we see, we were complaining, I don't actually remember whether it was on mic or off, but we've been wondering where Melanie is this Mm, season. Yeah. And last episode, I feel like we said either on mic or off, like, where is Melanie being? Mm-hmm. I, and we're kind of making up for that in this episode and yeah. getting some focus on her, which I appreciate. And not only getting some focus on her as like making up for it, but also explaining why haven't we seen Melanie this episode, this season? Because she has been a Trojan horse all season. Basically, yeah. Or maybe not a Trojan horse, maybe like a sleeper agent. Yeah, that's unclear. And we'll get more into that as we go on. Because is she working for Farouk? She's working for Oliver. And we've seen in the past that Oliver's plan to kill Farouk is somewhat, somehow connected to Melanie. Yeah, exactly. But knocking Carrie out is hard. But I don't know. Yeah. Clark out. Sorry. Knocking Clark out. That could be either Oliver's or Farouk's plan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not clear. It's really unclear. Although, I mean, the moment that I think she goes to this pool that is Farouk's head, basically. And Farouk talks to her about the monk. Mm -hmm. And... And Oliver salutes her. And that, I assume, is she immediately goes to Fukuyama and talks about the monk. Like, this is back earlier in the season. Yeah. So, the moment when Oliver salutes her with her martini, I feel like is saying, Hey, you know about the monk now. Go tell the others. She's not on Farouk's side. Because she immediately goes and tells them all about the monk. But also, I think that she is not on their side. Like what I was going to say, Division Three's division side. Threes, I was going to say whether she's working with Oliver or with Farouk. Either way, she's like a sleeper agent at Division Three, not really on Division Three's side. Yes, that's a good point. Because if Oliver is on Division Three's side, it's only sort of mm-hmm. right. I think Oliver's best case scenario only sort of aligns with division three's whole mission Mm -hmm. absolutely we skipped slightly ahead but like yeah we should comment on the scene with melanie and sid Mm -hmm. we watched them back to back the scene from chapter nine and this scene the first episode of season two Mm -hmm. And they are the same. It's the same words. I think some of the shots are a little different. Mm -hmm. And definitely by the end of the scene, it's completely different because her whole thing about the saddest words are vacant lot. In the original scene, Sid is there for that. And in this scene, she's disappeared. 
Or at the very least, she's not in the shot. She's not in the shot in the way she is in the original. And in the original, like, as Melanie's saying vacant lot or the saddest word, Sid is pouring that tea. Mm-hmm. And in this version, Mel- no one pours tea for Melanie. Yeah. And the, like, emphasis on the way you put it, that, like, Sid has disappeared, is, like, Melanie is talking about her loneliness, and the second time, the other person in the room just has disappeared. And whether she, we believe that her, you know, body has vanished, I don't really. But the way that it's shot is emphasizing Melanie's loneliness and isolation. And people just kind of come and go, like, Carrie just kind of comes and leaves, and it's very... I mean, it's all very, this a weird drug-induced state as well, that she's not really present. Yeah. She's trying to be as unpresent as possible. Hmm. That's a good point. That her drug use is specifically about uh, lack of presence. Mm-hmm. About deliberately removing herself from the situation that she's in we have the last episode had oliver singing my bonnie lies over the ocean to melanie and we get that again here i don't think it's the same moment right and this is where like a sleeper agent here he sings my bonnie lies over the ocean and like talks to her and whatever and then in the previous episode, but in the future of this time, he sings My Bonnie Lies Over the Ocean again, and it's like a trigger. Yeah, that's true. Melanie is Spike, is what I'm saying, from <laughs> season seven of Buffy. Of course. Makes perfect sense. It's interesting when Oliver shows up, like the last we saw of Oliver in in season one. Mm-hmm his like real self or whatever, he didn't remember Melanie. No. He did not know that she was his wife. And now he shows up and he completely knows and they talk to each other like they know each other. Yeah. And so is this with Farouk in his head, he's more aware or is it just that time has passed? Just before Farouk took possession of Oliver in Chapter 8, If I Ruled the World, he remembers Melanie. It's the last true. thing that happens before Farouk possesses him. <gasps> Melanie! And then he gets corrupted. So I, think it's, right. I think it's a matter of time has passed. But, like, that's what I think. But I also think it's possible to read it as Oliver still doesn't remember Melanie. This isn't Oliver. This yeah. is Farouk wearing an Oliver suit, manipulating Melanie by because Farouk has access to all of Oliver's memories and knows everything that Oliver ever knew. And he's no yeah. more Oliver than Lenny was Lenny in mm-hmm. season one. I don't think that's what's happening, but I think it could be. Yeah. I only don't think that's what's happening because it seems like Oliver has a plan. He is working against Farouk Mm -hmm. from what he said. We know that he doesn't want, he has a plan to kill him somehow. Mm. We see, like in their whole conversation, what do you make of their whole conversation about their marriage and their youth and the girl that was waiting for him is gone, but no, she isn't. He's not who she what who she fell in love with, but he is. Mm-hmm. Like it's it's more than just a conversation about how uh, you know she's hurt by his leaving. Mm-hmm. It's also a conversation about um, Theseus's boat again, right? Right. About like, is she the same person? She says, "I'm not the same person." Mm -hmm. that girl that you left is gone. And he says, no, she's not. She's still there and shows her a reflection of herself. And is that an illusion or is he showing her something true that like who you were continues to be who you are? Oh, Theseus's boat. I'm making a reference to our other podcast. We never talked about that on Clockworks. (laughs) I was trying to figure out when we talked about Theseus's boat. 
Um, for, in case you don't listen to our other podcast, which I shouldn't assume, uh, Thesis' Boat is a philosophical thought experiment where, uh, you know, Theseus has a boat and part of it gets damaged, so it gets replaced. And over the years, every bit of it gets replaced. At what point is it no longer the same boat? Mm-hmm. Is it the same boat after you have one by one over the years replaced every piece of wood and every piece of metal in the boat? It's funny because I was just watching an episode of Doctor Who today and it was they said, you know, if you have a broom and the and the handle breaks and you replace the handle and then later on the brush wears out and you replace the brush, is it the same broom? Which is the same concept. Yeah. And so the question here is, we talked about it uh, in our other podcast with reference to Mr. Potato Head, by the way. Right. But uh, the same concept as applied to a, an individual's identity is happening here. That, like, is there a continuity between your past self and your current self or not? Is kind of the philosophical question behind the relationship question. Or maybe in front of it. <laughs> And is past Melanie the same as present Melanie? And is past Oliver the same as present Oliver? And the fact that they were married once, does that have any real tie on them anymore? Especially when he was gone for 21 years. Exactly. Yeah. I found the conversation, reliving the conversation with Sid. Mm -hmm. Melanie talks about you know, they're men and the world isn't going to save itself and they go off and save the world. But Oliver wasn't the one saving the world. Oliver was trapped in an ice cube for 20 years. Melanie was trying to save the world in that moment. So what is she even talking about? Well, she says to David that uh, she spent all this time living out his dream. Mm, Yeah. So... She's the one who actually did act to save the world. But going off to save the world was his dream that she's living vicariously on his behalf. Yeah. For her all of season one. Mm-hmm. And the 20 years before that. I agree with you, though. Like, Oliver does not seem to have... Oliver seems to have planned to do this, but never actually done it. Yeah, exactly. And it's an interesting statement of, like, again, her identity and what it is and where it, who she really is, because she still thinks of this as her act, her, as Oliver's the one who does the thing. Mm-hmm. When, like, no. <laughs> no, really not. And what do we make of Melanie by the pool, young Melanie in Fruk's head by the pool, and then she turns into old Melanie again? I don't know if that, the fact that she goes from being young self to older self is like, I don't know if there's a big significance to that. It's just to show us that she continues to be the same person, I think. Mm -hmm. And that she can be whoever she wants or they can make her whoever she, whoever they want inside of Farouk's head yeah. and inside of Oliver's head. I think that is like what makes me really... That casts doubt on the idea that uh, Oliver is working against Farouk because she's in Farouk's head. He's the one pulling the strings. And when she turns and sees Oliver like raising his glass to her, Farouk is gone. Mm-hmm. Because they're the same person. It's not behind Farouk's back. It's Farouk and Oliver don't both exist. It's like Pokeru was here and I missed him again. Yeah. Or maybe not. Or maybe Farouk has left and it's only when Farouk has left that Oliver is safe to be like, wink. I don't know. According to Lenny, that she he kept them like drawers, like he might be, must might be in Oliver's body, but he's got lots of personalities in there. Yeah. So what do we make of Oliver talking about his body and that they should have burned it, and, and that, he could have been free? 
And that's like throughout this season, the race for the body and what David says he's going to do to Farouk's body is burn it. Mm -hmm. And Oliver says here that his body is what's tying him to the physical world. Is that a clue that burning Farouk's body is actually not going to be have the effect that they hope it will? That's what I assume. That's definitely what I assume. And that that shows what we were talking about a couple episodes ago in that he owns the state. If you, mm-hmm. he says, you know, like, if you kill me, I own the, I am the state. I am the heir to my own self. Right. Basically. Good call. So he, he knows that he wants his own body and to be in it. But possibly he wants his own body. He wants to burn his body because then he's free to be in the astral world and affect things that way. And maybe the best case scenario for him is to be alive in his body. But the second best case scenario is for his body to no longer exist. Exactly. Because right now he's trapped. He has to be latched onto someone's body. Right. Oh, uh, yeah. I think absolutely that I totally am persuaded by that theory. Mm-hmm. We have, oh yeah. Hmm. Back to Oliver. We have him like the way that he talks to Melanie. The way he says like, you could have tagged along. Mm-hmm. Ah, uh, tagged along. Is that not the right word? Followed. And like. Not better. Yeah, exactly. Not better. To say that he is, yeah, like he doesn't think of Melanie as a person. He thinks of her as basically like a plaything, it seems like. And we have, again, as we've done all through this season, characters who are mirror images of each other. Mm -hmm. That whether Oliver is acting on behalf of Farouk or not, we're really seeing here that Oliver is a lot like Farouk. Mm Mm-hmm. And we saw in first season that Oliver was a lot like David. And we've seen all through this season that David is a lot like Farouk. Mm Mm-hmm. All three of these characters have a lot in common with each other. Yeah. And not just in their powers being similar. Yeah. In the way that they don't really think of people as people. Mm Mm-hmm. That's why, like, followed is slightly better than tagged along. Yeah. But it still is like, Mm -hmm. (laughs) it kind of reveals that he thinks that he, I think it reveals that he thinks that the problem here is how he phrased it when the problem is what he's saying. Yeah, right. exactly. Uh, Because followed is better phrasing, but the idea of what he's saying that like, you can just do whatever I'm doing. Uh, You don't have a dream. You don't have identity of your own. Um, is a bigger problem than tagged along, which admittedly is infantilizing. However, she's convinced by it. Mm-hmm. Because by the end of this episode, that's what she's doing. She's yeah. wanting to be in his ice cube with him. She's wanting to, like in this next scene with Carrie, she's saying how, oh, it must have been nice for him to be in that ice cube. And suddenly she wants to be there too. And to skip way ahead to the very end, she has a, there's a shot, a split screen that shows him in the ice cube and her saying, oh, I want to come. Yeah, exactly. Hmm. This conversation with Carrie, where she's saying how, like, what if Carrie is a delusion because it's what male carry what wants is a younger version of himself, or maybe female carry wants an authority figure. Mm-hmm. And so they're both delusions of each other. And then she's like, no, but really you're all just in my head. And that's really the conclusion she comes to is the reality is just all in my head. And there's, I mean, yeah. <laughs> There's a lot there. Mm-hmm. I think I want to. St- I think actually to back up just very slightly, she starts her conversation with Carrie saying, 
or not starts. She starts this section of her conversation with Carrie saying, do you ever wonder if this is all just a dream? And I feel like that is directly addressed to Legion fans. <laughs> yeah. I think that this is all in David's head. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, like, do you ever wonder if this is all just a dream? I'm like, yes, I, a viewer of this television show, <laughs> do often wonder whether this television show is all just a dream. Yeah, absolutely. I'm glad that you're addressing this. Yeah. Um, and at the same time as it's, I think like it, it is kind of uh, trolling the audience to say that that directly. Mm-hmm. But it's also is a genuine question of like, it's a genuine question for the character and also a philosophical question for, you know, the universe that we've kind of addressed in this series so far. Mm-hmm. When we go back to uh, the monk who thought that he was a butterfly. Yeah. Right? And then woke up not knowing whether he was a butterfly dreaming he was a monk uh, philosopher a or monk, a philosopher. It's a monk in this show. Not knowing whether he was a monk dreaming he was a butterfly or a butterfly dreaming he was a monk. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So the specific delusion of like, this world is just a dream, we have explicitly and textually addressed on the show already as being a delusion. Right? Yeah, Exactly. And it's interesting how plausible it is, though, that, like, Carrie and Carrie, as delusional aspects of each other's personality, is like, yeah, that could be. Mm -hmm. I don't think... uh, You said that um, young Carrie imagines old Carrie because she wants an authority figure. But what Melanie says is that she wants authority. Mm, True. So I think what she wants is to be an authority figure, right. not to have one. I didn't think of it that way, but you're right. Anyway. I love Carrie in this scene. Yeah, me too. She's just like, I don't know what you're talking about, and I'm going to leave now. <laughs> you're having a senior moment. <laughs> like, yeah. She just like cannot take this at all. She's like, I just want to know if you're coming back to work. Stick to the practical. Yep. And we have this shot again that we had when David and Farouk were talking to each other in Farouk's mind of like the camera that seems to be on a pendulum. Yeah. Swinging, swinging back, and, back forth. and forth. And I kept expecting it to swing back and Carrie wouldn't be there. Yeah. Or she would be male Carrie or she would be someone else. But no. No. It's another it, really disorienting shot. Yeah. It really plays with your mind and plays with this idea of like, will someone else be there? You're unsure on your feet, unsteady as you're watching it. So what is it about living in an ice cube that Melanie finds attractive? Because I'm with Carrie when Melanie's like, oh, doesn't that sound nice? Living in an ice cube forever? And Carrie's like, no. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Why does it sound appealing to Melanie? I think escape. She's already trying to escape through drugs she's her dream came crashing down like or or oliver's dream or whatever it was of summerland and everything she was so confident last season and then that all ended and i think she just wants to get away from it she's just come to the conclusion that this isn't none of this is worth it i'd rather be in my own world and if i can just get away from everything that would be the best that's my take on it what about you yeah what was the in when we were in melanie's maze she was running the D simulation mm-hmm. and david tells her a story that she wanted to be what's the word that he uses um carefree right it's like the the ice cube is just another iteration of that same dream mm-hmm. right She wants to have no cares. And being in an ice cube is a different way than being a omnipotent, you know, God. But it's the same dream because what she wanted out of that maze was not to be, was not power. It was uh, being carefree. Mm -hmm. Right? Escape. It was escape. Exactly. And to her, like... 
stay in a box forever, be an untouchable god of a text-based game, the point of both of those is no one can touch you. Yeah. And she says this thing, reality is a choice. She does. And she said, who said that? And she doesn't know. And Sid has said that. And she said, David said it. Yep. And I went through every episode of Legion. David never said that. No, not not on screen. (laughs) No. So it's interesting, like, who said that? Uh... Sid did, but uh, how could Melanie know that Sid said that? And Sid claims that David is, that nobody, this is like everybody's citing someone who didn't say the thing. Mm-hmm. And who really said it? Well, it, reality is a choice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. So if we choose that David said it, then he did. Yep. Right? Except reality is not really a choice. <laughs> well... Reality is that which, when you stop believing in it, doesn't go away. Exactly. So it's not a choice. Right. (laughs) (laughs) Depends on your viewpoint, I suppose. I suppose. And what Melanie says at the end of this, like, we've been talking about it, like, she says, you're all in my dream, I'm the one who's dreaming it all. But what she actually says is, there is no world. I was trying to save the world. I didn't realize the obvious thing, which is there is no world. And in the first season, she called David a world breaker. And maybe he did. He broke her world completely. Yeah. Her world is gone and broken. Who? And it's David's fault. Yep. So we switch from Melanie to Carrie and Carrie. They're in the lab, and they both receive a vision of them taking a weapon and driving away. They decide to trust that David has a plan and do what he says, so they take the weapon, and female Carrie drives them away, driving for the first time, apparently. Lenny, meanwhile, enters a house full of people doing drugs, but no one pays her much attention until she tells the new Janine that she is Cornflake Girl. They decide to throw a giant party, and we see through a kaleidoscope Lenny doing drugs, dancing, kissing, until she gets a vision of Amy. She leaves to have sex with new Janine, and we see flashes of the future in the desert. When she wakes, Amy is there, who talks to her about David and asks for her body back. Lenny says she's going to do lots with her new body, but Amy says asks repeatedly if she's a good person. New Janine wakes and they talk about school plays. The Carries arrive at the Blue Octopus and leave the car. Female Carrie doesn't want to trust David, but male Carrie trusts him. Right. There's a moment when in with Carrie and Carrie he says that David put a vision in my head and Carrie corrects him with our head. Yeah. I found that really interesting. Because Carrie is upset at the prospect that maybe she doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. She's Carrie's delusion. Exactly. Like Melanie has gotten into Carrie's head. Mm-hmm. And then when Carrie talks as if they're both him, Carrie does not like that. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yep. I love, love, as <laughs> Carrie and Carrie are, like, going through and getting all the stuff. And they're like, all right, let's go. And male Carrie starts walking off in the wrong direction. Yeah. <laughs> it's such a quick moment. He, nod, he like, nods one way and she's like, and she just takes off the other way. And he's like, oh, okay. And he, he comes with her. He, like, takes half a step. And it's bit, partly, like, we haven't seen a lot of it this season. Uh Partly because we haven't seen a lot of him this season, but like Bill Irwin is a very, really gifted physical comedian. Yes, absolutely. And that gifted physical comedian does not only come in like 
big moments and pratfalls. No. It comes in like little moments of like just starting to walk in the wrong direction. And th- why is that so funny? But it's, it's partly Bill Irwin, but it's partly like Carrie and Carrie are not, are not seeing eye to eye. Mm-hmm. They're going Absolutely. off in different directions. And it's symbolic of the two of them, even though they aren't like uh, fighting like they were at near the end of season one. They're not as united as they used to be. Well, literally they're not. Yeah. They can't go inside of each other anymore. Yeah. And we see that visualized in them heading off in different directions and carries the one female carries the one who knows what to do and where to go. Mm -hmm. But they really do complete each other in terms of like skill set. Yeah. I also love Carrie being like, I'll drive. Do you know how to drive? How hard could it be? And then we hear like squealing tires as she drives away. We don't see it, but she's having trouble driving. Yeah, absolutely. She's very like a petulant teenager a little bit in some ways she is and then we get lenny in like presumably this is you know a house she used to hang out in right yeah when this shot starts it shows like a frog a baby a cow all with like the drug tube coming out of their mouths And, like, it's the cow again. There's the cow. Mm. (laughs) And also, like, in the world of Legion, there's only one way to do drugs. And it's, like, breathing in the smoke from a ceramic object. Well, I mean, what other way is there? What other way is there? That's how you do drugs. All drugs. And I'm, like, (laughs) I'm enough of a straight lace or square, depending on your worldview that i'm like is that a real thing (laughs) can you really like have a ceramic thing that smokes things for you and you get high because it makes vapor i don't i don't know these things these are these are foreign to me yeah me too (laughs) uh if i was gonna get one it would be melanie's elephant though it looks the coolest to me i like the cow (laughs) (laughs) well i know what to get you for christmas yes absolutely so what is the, sorry, I kind of derailed. No, I mean, there isn't much more than that. Just like, here's the cow again. Here's what we've seen from Lenny before, except that it wasn't Lenny, it was Benny. Right. Like with the ceramic frog, that was Benny. And so like to have her associated with this it just further conflates this weird, like, who who was she? Yeah. And this Lenny that we see is once again, like, she's, there's some connection to the Lenny that we saw in the mental hospital, but she's also not playing her exactly the same. No. Uh, and is that just because she's not medicated anymore? Mm-hmm. Or because she's had different experiences, or because and she's like, been through. I think because she's been through so much trauma. Yeah, but it comes back once again to like we saw with young and old Melanie. Like, is she the same person? Hmm. And is that question even sensical? Yeah, because it's and, much more complicated with Lenny. And then we come right to another version, another iteration of that same question: with Are you the new Barbara? Right, yeah. No, I'm the new Janine. Who's Janine? She was the new Barbara. Yeah. And that character, we never get any name for her other than the new Janine. Yeah. So it's a whole different way of being a different person. Mm -hmm. Like, not in a psychic sense, but in a filling the role. And we don't know, like, was Barbara, like, the dude's girlfriend or, like, the drug dealer of the place? The Like, what do you mean the new Barbara? Yeah. What role did Barbara have? that Janine had that now new Janine has. We really have no idea. Mm-hmm. When 
Lenny comes in and is talking to the new Janine. She's like, I'm Lenny, by the way. And new Jean's like, yeah, okay, whatever, cool. Painting the dude's toenails. <laughs> uh, and Lenny says, the cornflake girl. And then that, like, changes everything. Yeah. And new Janine's like, oh. And then the dude is like, oh, it's the original whatever. Cracker Jack. Let's throw a big party. Yeah. He recognizes her. He recognizes her. But like, so we called, it was a cornflake girl. This is not the first time that Lenny has been called the cornflake girl. In chapter 10, Swing on a Star, when David and Oliver and Lenny are all in the, on the carousel in the astral plane, David asks Lenny, like, are you in any way the same Lenny that I knew from the mental hospital, the cornflake girl. And Lenny says, it doesn't matter. Yeah. And so the same question, by the way, of like, is there continuity in a person's identity from one moment to the next? Uh, and like, that's weird. Like the, I, that's weird. Mm-hmm. <laughs> when I hear the cornflake girl, especially, I didn't think of it in this way in chapter 10, but I think of it in this time, I mean, my mind immediately goes to Tori Amos. Right, do, yeah. Do you know uh, the Tori Amos song, Cornflake Girl? I did not know it until you played it for me today. Yeah, I just, that was like a lie of a question because I knew you didn't and then I played it for you. But so <laughs> I just assumed that she ate a lot of cornflakes like she's going to do in this episode. There's a Tori Amos song called Cornflake Girl. Uh, that, it, like, Tori Amos's music, Tori Amos's lyrics are so trippy and complicated and uh, with layers of symbolic meaning that it's kind of amazing to me that we haven't had Tori Amos on the soundtrack of Legion yet. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I can't believe that this isn't a Tori Amos reference. I'm the cornflake girl. And in, in Tori Amos, a cornflake girl is... Uh, contrasted to a raisin girl cornflake girls are like the girl who acts like your friend but uh will hurt you when she gets a chance to just will hurt you despite being your friend Mm -hmm. a raisin girl is rarer yeah there's more cornflake girls i mean we might now say cornflake girls are basic bitches yeah right it's a different language for the same idea so then when lenny identifies herself as a cornflake girl and you're like she really is the kind of girl who will hurt, will hurt you, even though she claims to be your friend and yeah. is connected to you. So, like, she certainly does that to David. In that sense, she is like a cornflake girl is indicating that she's dangerous. But then there's another possible meaning of cornflake girl that is uh, basically a cornflake is possibly has in Tori Amos. Cornflake is sometimes possibly read as an allusion to female genitalia. Hmm. Right. Uh, in which case, Cornflake Girl is kind of code for lesbian. Yeah. And then, so that might re- explain the way that new Janine reacts. Not only, oh yeah, I've heard of you, you're famous around here, but like, oh. And then they go and have sex. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And then... In the song Cornflake Girl, not to drive this into the ground, but the chorus of Cornflake Girl by Tori Amos is, this is not really, this, this, this is not really happening. Mm -hmm. You bet your life it is. (laughs) Which seems like it could be the theme song for Legion. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Did you notice in this scene, and we come back to this kitchen later, so either in this scene or later... The decor in this apartment and what's written on the wall. I didn't see what was written. I just saw all the eyes. There's eyes everywhere. There's on the wall. I notice it in this scene. And then later when uh, new Janine is poking at the ceiling with an umbrella. I don't know. Is it an umbrella? Yeah, it's an umbrella. Yeah. Um, There's a great big what written Mm, on the wall. Right. What? Question mark. What? Uh, In like multicolored paint or whatever Mm -hmm. this whole apartment is full of like psychedelic imagery and 
eyes and question marks and rainbow colors. There's definitely one specific pair of eyes that's kind of like over the archway door kind of thing that look very similar to in season one, Lenny's eyes appear and watch over people Mm -hmm. in, in like mental clockworks. So it's very much an allusion to that. Yeah, I think so. Then they have the big party, Mm -hmm. which is shot through a kaleidoscope, as you said. Yeah. I don't know. Which just makes it more trippy and, (laughs) and it makes it hard to recognize Amy at first when she, when she first shows up, because you kind of just see her moving her head with herself. And it isn't until really Lenny notices her that you notice her as well. Yeah. I totally think you're right. The kaleidoscope is part of why that, why you don't recognize her right away. I mean, you did recognize her right away. Why I I didn't recognize her right away. True. I did recognize her right away. (laughs) And then Amy and, I mean, and then Lenny and new Janine have sex. Do you notice the fishnets? No. New Janine is wearing fishnets, which reminds me of Lenny wearing fishnets. Hmm. And then Amy appears. Yeah. What do you make of Amy and Lenny's conversation here? Well, I like that Amy is basically like, hey, um, could I have my body back? <laughs> and Lenny's just like, "I, if I could, <laughs> then I would. Except she wouldn't, even if she could. But Lenny's all, it's a much healthier body than mine was. <laughs> yeah. So that's really funny. I really like the moment where Lenny's like, not, I don't want to, I like it, but I don't know how to do that. Yeah. And I believe her. Yeah, absolutely. That like, whether I want to, whether you can persuade me to or not, is kind of a moo point. <laughs> Moot. <laughs> <laughs> Though there are a lot of cows, so we'll go with moot. a lot of cows on this show, I think the point is moo. <laughs> the point is moo. Um, I don't know how to do that. Mm-hmm. I think I really like that, both in world and out of world to like for as a writing decision, let's kind of short circuit this conversation Mm -hmm. by saying it doesn't matter whether how persuasive Amy is. (laughs) And it goes well with what you were saying last time that sometimes this show goes, the characters within this show are just as weirded out by all this stuff as you are. Yep. That Lenny's like, I don't know how to make you in my body. I don't know why this, this uh, monastery keeps moving around the desert. It's weird. Yep. Are you a good person? What? Why does she ask that over and over? It's connected to give me my body back. Do you deserve to live when I don't? Mm-hmm. Amy has a sense that people get what they deserve. Yeah. She has a sense of like, despite the terrible things that have happened to her on like in the run of this show, we get an idea that before the show started, she kind of had a worldview that was things basically turn out like they should. Hmm. And for her, this whole, the events of her life while this show has been going on are like a massive challenge to that. Yeah. But she still is trying to reassert it. So like, are you a good person? Because if you're not, you need to be dead and I need to be alive. Hmm. Yeah. Or maybe uh, it's about like, well, now you've got a body again and you've got a self again. And this idea that we've been, we've talked about through the whole, or that I keep coming back to of identity and, uh, what makes you the same person as you were before. And Amy is suggesting to Lenny that she has an opportunity now to be who she wants to be. Mm -hmm. You've got a new body and a new, you know, lease on life. Yeah. Uh, Who are you going to be now? Mm -hmm. And it upsets Lenny. Yeah, definitely. Like, and she plays it off as like, not the worst, not the best, but it upsets her because on some level she wants to be a good person, I think. Yeah, exactly. Right? 
So when New Janine wakes up, they talk about, you know, Lenny makes some stupid reference to I'm practicing for the school play. But Janine talks about being in a play that she describes as waiting for Godot, Mm -hmm. waiting for a guy who doesn't show up. Yeah. And what's the meaning in that? Because I think there is something. Possibly it's talking about waiting for David, waiting for Farouk. Farouk is the one who sees himself as the god. Mm, yes. Godot is a metaphorical stand-in for god. Yes. So they're waiting for god who never comes. Uh I mean, I'm going to cards on the table I've never read Waiting for Godot. Yeah, me neither. Uh, I only know what other people have said about it. But what everyone says about Waiting for Godot (laughs) is that Godot represents God and he never shows up because it's an existentialist play Mm -hmm. about uh, human existence is waiting around for God never to act. Mm -hmm. Um, And that is either because there is no greater power than David and Farouk and there, you know, nothing's going to stop them. There is no actual God. Mm -hmm. Or it's because David is the God of this uh, show. Yeah. That is, he's the benevolent, he's the theoretically benevolent superpower who's going to reach in and make things right. And we're waiting for him and he's not going to show up. Mm -hmm. Well, and I mean... Just to say now, David doesn't show up in this episode. Right. So this is an episode without David. So this is an episode without our god of our show. Yeah. Yeah. And like at this point in the episode, are you the re- the viewer waiting for David to show up because it's his show? Yeah, a little bit. Like we're a long way into the episode. <laughs> yep. And it's never going to happen. Or if Farouk is the god, he's the one who wants to be god, uh, in what sense does he never, are they waiting for him and he's never going to come? Maybe we won't know until the season finishes. Maybe not. So in the kitchen, Mm -hmm. Lenny eats cornflakes while new Janine pokes the ceiling. Lenny asks about the blue octopus, and she sees the angriest boy sitting there before Janine pops the ceiling and she awakes. Amy is there, and Lenny tries to smother her, but Amy appears on the other side of the room and tells her she needs to do David's plan. Outside the window is a blue octopus. Carrie and Carrie eat at a restaurant looking over the parking lot, They discuss Melanie, and Carrie has trouble grasping metaphors. Male Carrie is worried about death, and then they watch as Lenny approaches the car. She gets in, and it starts on its own, glowing green and then disappearing. But Carrie has a tracking device. In the desert, the car appears and catches fire, but she gets a box from the trunk before it can burn up. Lenny turns to see a group of people with boxes on their heads sitting next to a giant pink plug. (laughs) Oliver is in a rickshaw communicating with Melanie as she talks aloud with him walking through Division 3. She sees a vision of Oliver's ice cube and says she wants to come too. She questions the violence, but still hits Clark. Lightning and thunder roll and Melanie walks through a dark space to stand in front of a man who touches her face. That part where Janine is, uh, (laughs) new Janine, it has the umbrella and is poking the ceiling, makes you so uncomfortable. It was like, watching it the first time, you were like, I cannot handle this. I was squirming. I was like... That that's gonna that's gonna break. That's gonna break. It's gonna be the worst thing that has ever happened. <laughs> Why is that the worst thing that's ever happened? I don't know. I've <laughs> never had like it's not like a past trauma. I've never lived somewhere where that happened. Oh, we did have a little bubble of water in our wall one time. In our wall. But a little it was like tiny. Yeah. But like, I don't know. I f- it feels so like Stop poking it. Stop poking it. I mean, 
I can talk about my own personal, like, you're going to be dropped down with, it's going to be skeezy water. Yeah. And like the water that the show shows us is way cleaner than what would actually happen in that circumstance. Oh yeah, That is sure. not clean water and your house is ruined. <laughs> oh yeah, it already is ruined if you have that in it. Yeah. It... But also in symbolic terms for the show is like, New Janine is poking at this thing that is weird and curious, but poking at it is going to make things so much worse. Mm -hmm. But also doing nothing is eventually going to have the same result. Yeah. If you don't poke at it, it's eventually going to burst and collapse on you anyway. Mm -hmm. So there's a bit of like a symbolic, what are they supposed to do? Yeah. If your choices are poke it or don't, Either way, you're getting wet. Yeah. You know? I wanted to comment in this section that uh, Lenny talks about an electric octopus. And I just wanted to call out that Carrie calls it a blue octopus. Mm -hmm. And that's just a little detail that I love because they're just avoiding bad writing trap mm, yeah. when characters refer to an object using the same words, even though they aren't. They haven't heard each other call it that. Right. I love that Carrie calls it a blue octopus and Lenny calls it an electric octopus. And those are both accurate descriptions. And if they had both called it the blue octopus, I would be like, why do they both know it's called the blue, the blue octopus? Yeah, that's true. And I didn't even so many that. scripts do that. Mm -hmm. I just love that they avoid that. <laughs> yeah, it's a good call. Um. What's his name? Dude in the house. I don't think he ever gets a name. No, I don't think he gets a name. He says, we understand life backwards, but it's got to be lived forwards. Who said that? <laughs> New Janine says, you did. No, but who said it first? You did. <laughs> um, and the whole who said that conversation is just like Melanie and uh, Realities of Choice. Who mm -hmm. said that? Um, and do you know who actually said that? Who did actually say that? That is actually uh, Kierkegaard. I'm unsurprised. We have discovered at this point that Noah Hawley really likes him some Kierkegaard. Yep. Uh, there's a connection to Waiting for Godot. Kierkegaard is an existentialist philosopher and Waiting for Godot is existentialist art. Mm -hmm. So just it's, they're both about, uh, you know, the the prospect of futility mm -hmm. yeah and we understand life backwards but it's got to be lived forwards but that means is more complex than this really but we can simplify it as saying like it's about futility it's about like we can't how do we even apply our knowledge to our actions is what Kierkegaard's getting at. That yeah. like, we can only look backwards. But how does that help us? Because we got to li live forwards. And meaning for all the existentialist philosophers is like, yeah, good luck. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right? Yeah. Also, just in this little conversation, want to call out to... Have you ever seen an electric octopus? Yeah, once. Oh no, octopus? I thought you meant you said ocelot. Yeah. What? <laughs> well, and like, this whole scene is a dream. Like, this is, it didn't actually happen. And so, it's like, this whole messed up thing of like, it's not even really happening. You bet your life it is. <laughs> you think it's happening? I'm just quoting uh, Tori Amos. Oh, okay. But, so, like, he's saying all this stuff, but, like, that's very much dream logic. That, no, no, it wasn't an octopus. It was an ocelot. And her seeing the angriest boy makes more sense if it, this is a dream. This is just in her head because she's haunted by those past images. But he's not actually there. Yeah. Unless he is. And, like... The reason it's a dream is because after Janine, after new Janine pokes the ceiling and the water falls, Lenny wakes up. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that that didn't happen. Maybe not. It could just be we're cutting to when yeah. she wakes up later. Yeah. She, 
the thing on the ceiling too is a little bit boob like. <laughs> and so I felt like if she's having a dream right after she's had sex, she's dreaming about a boob. Okay. Maybe, maybe. that's maybe that's miss me seeing things, but I I maybe I guess that's possible. I really expected him to say, oh, it wasn't an octopus, it was an eel. But no, an ocelot. An ocelot. So much better. Yeah. I was expecting him to say, it's that bar that's across the street. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's the electric octopus. Oh, man. He's not a helpful person. No. Except it's only a dream, so he can't give her new information. Exactly. Which is why it's definitely a dream. Yeah. We have, and then Amy shows up, but it's like, you've got to do what you're told. Mm -hmm. And she, the line of like, it, the blue octopus is probably in Helsinki, which is it in, uh, where does she say? She doesn't say in, Finland. It's either in Helsinki or in Stockholm, whichever one of those is in Switzerland. Right. <laughs> and then the. They have a, like the conversation moves on, and the very last thing that Amy says is, "Neither Helsinki nor Stockholm are in Switzerland." Yep. For the record, Helsinki's in Finland, and Stockholm is in Sweden. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I just like I'm glad that Amy said that because I was, I, or I don't know, I don't know if I'm glad Amy said that or if it would have been even better to just leave that unsaid. I can't quite decide. I think I like her saying it. I like her saying it because it's also what you just said about new information. It shows that this is really Amy. Right. This isn't some vision that Lenny is having that is telling her things she already knows. She doesn't know, but Amy is giving her the information. That is a very good call. Why it's important that Amy tells her that neither Helsinki nor Stockholm are in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. Ooh, good that's something call. something that Amy would know. Something Amy would know, and it's, it's, Amy isn't just Lenny. And Amy also knows what's out the window. She's standing yeah. right in front of the window where you need to look out to see the blue octopus. The electric octopus. <laughs> Whatever. The neon octopus. It's no, more neon, which we've seen a lot in this season. We have. It's kind of glowing things like that. And before we leave... This scene, new Janine comes in oh, yeah. and tells Lenny, your majesty, we're going to have a little prince. <laughs> what? what? <laughs> yeah, that's just weirdness. And I mean, new Janine is just, she's not all there. No. I mean, like, again, on one level, that is about new Janine is stoned out of her mind mm -hmm. and says weird things because she's really high all the time or at this moment, maybe not all the time, but on another level, like uh, the writers wrote that line and they could have written any line. Yeah, that's true. So, and like they, she calls her your majesty because the guy says that Lenny was the queen. Mm hmm. That's fine. That I don't think I need to dig into any further than that. But like, we're going to have a little prince. I don't like. I just, I don't know what that's about. I no. said like there's some meaning because the writers could have written anything. Maybe it is just like, let's write something weird for her to say. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know. It's a weird line. I found it very, like, what? <laughs> I like it, though. I like the weirdness a yeah. lot, obviously. So, Carrie and Carrie in the restaurant. And, like, has, has female Carrie always been this, like, dense about metaphors and stuff? I don't... It seemed out of nowhere to me. I think that her looking at her hands when he says time on her hands is too much. Yeah. Uh, but she's so practical. Yeah, she is. She has come out when there was something practical to do and then gone back in and hasn't really paid attention to stuff. And definitely we have always established that uh, 
male carry knows a lot more that female carry does not share all of male carry's knowledge no definitely not right she's very young she's very young she only ages when she's out of carry's body and she's only out of carry's body to do practical things it's most especially violence but also like you know sometimes to keep him company or whatever presumably Mm -hmm. especially when they were both younger yeah I don't think it's that hard to believe that she, like, nuanced. And we've seen all along, like, she's bored with interpretation. Yes. That's a good point. We saw that earlier in this episode when Melanie's like, are you only in Carrie's head? And she's partly like, well, like you said, I don't understand this and I'm going to leave now. Mm -hmm. Right? On the other hand, a senior moment is a figure of speech. So she knows what figure of speeches are. Yeah, exactly. Figures of speech, not figure of speeches. I do love, though, so I think looking at her hands is a a little step too far. Yeah. But I absolutely adore the moment of Melanie's not herself. An imposter. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) That is a fantastic moment. Mm Mm-hmm. I think that's perfect. Yeah, that's very in character. And the the I'm gonna die. I'll stab death twice in the heart before he gets to you. Yeah, I love is, that too. Is also, yeah, sweet and terrifying. Yeah. But she doesn't want to recognize that that could happen either. No. And of course not. Yeah. And that too is like just to to be nitpicky. I love this show so much that I can nitpick when it fails uh to be perfect. Like, I'd stab death twice in the heart shows that she has control over idiom and metaphor. Mm-hmm. Exactly. She is not stupid enough to think that death is a literal thing she can stab. Yeah, exactly. And that's not what she means when she says that. There's yeah. no way that's what she means. Yeah, exactly. So that line doesn't jive with her looking at her hands when he says time on your hands. Mm-hmm. I kind of am okay with she's blue, like the color. No, it's a figure of speech. Oh, I would have been okay if you'd stopped there. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, So the first time we watched this, and probably the second and third times I watched it too, the car disappearing like that (laughs) was so shocking and not what I expected. (laughs) But like... Okay, Lenny gets in the car. She doesn't have the keys. How is she going to drive it? Oh, it just magics. (laughs) Yep. What? Did David do something to that car? Is that just like him? I think David is just capable of controlling it even from that distance. Yeah. I I was told like the car door shutting by itself, starting by itself. That was, you know, unexpected, but I wasn't thrown. Yeah. But I was expecting her to then drive away. Yeah, exactly. Teleports. I totally with you was like, what? What just happened? (laughs) My favorite, I've like said so many, but one of my very favorite moments of all of Legion is that after the car teleports and Lenny gets out of the car and like drops her coat and strides away looking all badass. And then she's like, oh yeah, the weapon (laughs) goes back and gets it. Yeah. All that entire shot is like, oh, uh, it's art. Yeah. Uh-huh. And just to point out, we've seen that shot before when David was pl- is planning out his whole desert operation, desert mm-hmm. storm, <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> um, we saw that a shot of Lenny in front of that burning car. We did. So we already knew that was coming. Yep. We've seen a shot of Carrie and Carrie with the tracking device mm-hmm. in the desert by the burning by the burnt out car so we haven't seen that exact moment yet but we we've seen them with the tracking device we know yeah yeah we know that moment is coming mm-hmm. yeah and the and like in lenny setting up with the sniper mm-hmm. we saw we've seen it a few we times. saw it in this episode mm-hmm. flashed forward and we saw it back when david was doing his plan flashed forward and when David touched Lenny yep, when he visited exactly. her. So that has come up several times. Mm-hmm. And then in the desert. Yeah. 
There's a bunch of cross-legged people in blue shirts wearing boxes on their heads sitting next to a gigantic pink drain plug. Yeah, like exactly like, like a you thing do. you would put in your drain to plug it with like a chain coming out of it, except it's gigantic. Yeah. Or they are very, very small. I think it's gigantic. Yeah. And they're with boxes on their heads, so they are very reminiscent of Fukuyama. Yeah. But they don't have baskets. They have boxes. Yep. And they're all blue, and the plug is pink. Mm-hmm. So, next Moving episode, on. I think we'll find out what that's about. I think we're not finding out anything out about that this episode. So, moving on. <laughs> yeah, I've just like... Definitely, the first time we watched it, I didn't really catch even what she saw. It had to kind of, I had to kind of really look on the second watching of like, oh, what is that weird, like, it's a giant pink plug? What is even going yeah, on I here? Yeah, I didn't recognize it as a plug the first time just because it was so surreal yeah exactly my brain just didn't accept it as yeah. what it obviously is i thought it was a salad spinner i thought it was a building no oh, there you go <laughs> that's much more logical than my giant salad spinner <laughs> <laughs> i don't know that a giant salad spinner makes any more sense than a giant uh plug but no it doesn't we have melanie the the end of this episode is all mm-hmm. melanie talking to oliver telepathically Yes. And she says, he's here. Mm-hmm. You could hear the yelling throughout the building. Yeah. What yelling? This is where I'm thrown. Is because I feel like the he she's talking about is David. You think that. But it, then there's yelling. And he's not there. No. Right? I think that it's a red herring to think... I think we're meant to think that she's talking about David, but I think she's not. She can't be. Because in the same... Con- she's like, he's here. You can hear the yelling throughout the building. He wants revenge to scoop out your eyes. There was a letter for the girl he left alone. So, like, she's being incoherent because she's both high and uh, crazy. And because we're only hearing the one side of the conversation. And because we're only hearing half the conversation. But, like... There's a letter for the girl means we've planted this in time in the continuity of the show. Yeah. So when she says he's here is after David has left a letter. And if she knows that David left a letter and left alone, then he's not here. Yeah. The he who's here isn't David. Right. Are you sure he's here? And we're meant to think, oh, she thinks David's here, but he's not. But later in the conversation, if we're paying attention, it's clear that she knows David's not there. Right. So she's talking about someone else. So who else is there? Who's someone the who wants revenge against Farouk and is yelling? Mm-hmm. It's Professor X. Oh, is that what you think? Yeah. We forgot last week, by the way, to mention the professor. We that, did. That Farouk says to, or that. Uh, the driver says to Farouk, the, talks about the professor, and we completely skated past it and didn't weren't like, hello, Professor X, that's who he's talking about. Yeah. That's David's father. And here, you think it's Professor X who's there with yelling. Ooh. Who would want revenge against Farouk and scoop out his eyes? Of course. Interesting. I'm prepared to be proved wrong in the next episode, but I'm taking a stand that that's what I think. I'm excited. About that prospect. I don't think he's going to appear in this season, but I'm excited about the prospect of him being around. Yep. Because also, uh, Farouk is still very interested in the professor. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. And we, because this show is David's show, we kind of forget. But David isn't Farouk's nemesis. Mm -hmm. His father is. David's father is Farouk's nemesis. Mm -hmm. That's who Farouk is fixated on. Yeah. Really? Ooh, that's interesting. (laughs) I did not even think of that. I was so confused by this conversation. I'm so glad you you have an idea. So she goes, she wants to be in the ice cube. Mm -hmm. And she knocks out um, Clark and doesn't like the violence but then yep. she ends up in this dark space 
and we yeah. don't see who she's touching. Like we see the back of him, we see a hand coming to her face, and we assume that it's Oliver. But right. is it? Yeah. Where is she? Mm-hmm. And who's she meeting? I think it can't I think if it was Oliver, we would have seen it was Oliver. Exactly. Or we're meant to think it's Oliver, but it but since we don't see his face, it might not be. Yeah. And I think since we don't see his face, it isn't. Mm-hmm. But I don't know who it is. I don't have a theory of that one. No, me neither. I mean, that's not the Rex. <laughs> no. So, I just don't know. We'll have to wait till next episode. I don't have a theory. No. Of who it is she's meeting. Mm-hmm. Or even where she is. Like, the space that she's in is not familiar. I assumed it was some kind of mental space. It was like the astral plane. Oh, maybe. It's like the walls look kind of like baskets. Oh, yeah. Right? That's a good point. But the ground is like uh, sand. Mm -hmm. So maybe the walls being baskets suggest Fukuyama. Mm -hmm. But the sand is like the desert where Oliver and Farouk are right now. Yeah. I don't know. I'm grasping at straws because I, I. I don't know yep. what any of this is. Yep. But that's where it ends. That's the end of our episode. So what are some of the songs that get done in this episode? Do you want to talk about those? Yes. While Melanie is getting high in her room and dancing all around, the song playing is a Flaming Lips song called The Castle. Um, we don't hear very much of it. A lot of the music in this episode we hear short snippets of. There are a lot of songs and we hear little snippets of them. Right. So the Flaming Lips song, The Castle, uh, goes, the words that we hear, her eyes were butterflies, her smile was a rainbow, her hair were su- was sunbeam waves, shining round like a halo, her face was a fairy tale that has a poison apple. It sounds a lot like she comes in colors. It sure does. The song that played while Sid is dancing around. And so we're paralleling melanie and sid Mm -hmm. we're having melanie be future sid yeah which we've definitely paralleled them before yeah and if oliver is like david melanie is like sid and we've had a future sid in this throughout this whole season let's remember Mm -hmm. and if melanie is future sid and young melanie is sid right yep we have both sid and melanie are characters that we see both in the past and, past future. and pre- future. I mean, you t- you said in this dancing scene that Melanie tries to eat an apple. Uh, and the words of the song says, her face was a fairy tale that has a po- poison apple. Hmm. And it, all of this suggests, you know, it's uh, imagery of like a transcendent and beautiful person but the song the castle much like the song she comes in colors is actually about a person known to the songwriter who had mental illness and ended up killing themselves oh really both songs are that's interesting. so it's like she's beautiful and her her eyes are butterflies her smile is a rainbow but there's a poison apple and she's ill Mm -hmm. right and the castle, the song The Castle keeps going about, like, the castle falls and it can never be rebuilt again. Another song played. Um, when Lenny arrives at the, like, house and the guy recognizes her, the song playing is called Space is Only Noise If You Can See. It is by Nicholas Yar. You might recognize that name because we have had a Nicholas Yar song on the soundtrack before. He wrote the uh, Mi Muher song uh, that is in was Spanish language that was playing while Clark is walking along and the Vermilion are following him and he turns around and they freeze. Mm-hmm. Um, Space is only noise if you can see is in English. Uh, it's playing, as I said, 
when Lenny first arrives at like the drug house. Mm-hmm. Um, and some of the lyrics that we hear are, have you, have you always crossed like this? Have you always crossed like this? Have you been this way all the time? We don't hear much more of the lyrics than that. Mm-hmm. But that connects really to what I've been uh, harping on all episode. Have you been this way all the time? Yeah. Is who you are now, how who you've always been. Mm-hmm. And for Lenny, it definitely, she definitely isn't. Exactly. Then when they have the party in the house, the song is Kick Out the Jams by MC5. The lyrics that we hear, uh, well, I feel pretty good and I guess I could get crazy now, baby, because we've all got because we all got in tune and when the dressing room got so hazy now baby i know you want it child hot quick and tight let me kick out the jams i am not sure i have a complex metaphorical meaning for this song it's I just basically it's a party song kind of a rocking song and kick out the jams is like you know let's let loose mm. and if it has a deeper meaning it's in the you know, Lenny says, you know how long it's been since I let loose? Yeah. And there's a song about letting loose. Well, Carrie and Carrie are in the Chinese restaurant. The song playing is Mon Enfance by Jacques Brel. Uh, it is a French language song and the words are, some of the words, it gets quite long. Some of the words that we hear are my childhood passed in gray silences, Hmm. false reverences, and uh, missing battles. My childhood passed, my childhood passed, and eventually it says my childhood uh, exploded and became adolescence, Hmm. and the wall of silence one morning broke. Uh... And the war came, and here we are tonight. Well, the end of childhood seems definitely relevant to Carrie and Carrie. Yeah. Where she's she's coming out of her childhood and having to live apart from him. Yeah, absolutely. And the idea of, uh, and the war arrived, and here we are. Mm -hmm. And now I'm an adolescent. Yeah. And it's... Carrie, Carrie's child, female Carrie's childhood in some su- significant sense is ending at this moment mm-hmm. and in this season. But also all the characters are in some sense moving from one part of their life, from one aspect of their life, from one uh, phase of their life into another phase. Mm-hmm. And whether it's childhood into adolescence or whether it's, you know, a kind of innocence into a lack of it, into a loss of that innocence. Yep. And the war is here now. And we've had a lot of talk about war in this season. When Lenny gets into the car and the radio turns on, the song that plays is by the Kinks. It is called Destroyer. Um, we don't hear very much at all about it, of the lyrics, but we hear self-destroyer, wreck your health, destroy friends, destroy yourself. That seems, uh, you know, relevant to Lenny mm-hmm. and her approach to life in general. Yeah. Destroyer, uh, the, the song is a lot more about, um, yeah, self-destruction than about, like, being a destroyer of others. Yeah. You know? Paranoia. Uh, it talks about paranoia. They destroy you. I fell asleep. Then I woke. Uh, one day you're going to self-destruct. You're up. Get down. This plan of David's is destructive and destruction is self-destructive. And it is possibly a suggestion that even if it does work out all well, uh, Lenny is self-destructive. David also is self-destructive. A lot of people on this show are Mm self-destructive. A lot of people in this episode are engaged in self-destructive behavior. 
Side note, I didn't know this kink song at all, but uh, the first line, met a girl called Lola and I took her back to my place. I didn't know there's like a sequel. <laughs> I know. Lola comes up again. Anyway, that's just uh, nothing to do with Legion. Uh, so yeah, so those are the songs in this episode. Hmm. And the allusion to Cornflake Girl, which we already talked about. Cornflake Girl doesn't play, but I feel like it's a presence. The song is a presence in this episode. Yeah. There was one bit of feedback that I wanted to highlight this uh, time. Nikki Fennell on Twitter said, I listened to your latest podcast and was surprised that you didn't mention that Uncanny is one of the names of the early X-Men comics. And like, yeah, we're dumb, guys. We... <laughs> can't believe we talked so much about like uncanny uncanny and didn't mention like uncanny x-men is a thing was yep. a thing yeah that was just like our stupidity sometimes that we get so into like talking about the show as the show and forget like oh yeah there's also the comics and stuff too that we have some knowledge about and some more knowledge than we used to but still we get so caught up, caught up in the show as the show yeah and it was a massive oversight to talk about the uncanny in the context of Legion and not talk about uncanny X-Men. Because yeah. if you know X-Men, uncanny X-Men is like Incredible Hulk. Yeah, exactly. Like it's their adjective. Yeah, exactly. Or the amazing, amazing Spider-Man. Spider like it's the word that goes with X-Men. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So, uncanny should have screamed out at us as yeah. an X-Men reference and it just you know, you know, sometimes you miss things. Exactly. So thanks for pointing that out. Yeah. If you want to point out our stupid flaws and <laughs> <laughs> and great things and whatever, you can uh, get in touch with us via Twitter at ClockworksCast. You can also email us ClockworksCast at gmail.com. We're also on uh, Facebook and Reddit and Instagram, all those local all those looks, all those links are in our show notes. What else can you do if you like us, Paul? You can rate and review us and you can tell a friend about us, uh, an actual person who you know that this podcast exists. That would be super helpful and we'd greatly appreciate it. If you like the show, you can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash clockworkscast and get access to extra stuff we make. During the month of June, our Patreon-exclusive podcast, Current Obsession, where we talk for from 5 to 20 minutes about whatever it is that we are obsessed with at the moment. Normally, it is only for patrons. During June, it is for anyone. So if you go to patreon.com slash clockworkscast and click on the tab for Current Obsession, we've made those public for anyone to listen to during June, and we talk about... Most recently, Jane the Virgin, that we talked, we have talked in the past about The Handmaid's Tale, about Bob's Burgers, about... Uh, the Bright Sessions. About advice columns, like so many different things, just whatever it is that we have been... Uh, you might be surprised to learn we both have kind of obsessive personalities. <laughs> uh, so we get into a thing. And when we notice that we have gotten really obsessed with a thing, we do a little podcast about what it is we're obsessed with. You can listen to those during all of June uh, without even supporting us just to get a taste of what that is. I've been Paul Moffat. I've been Jan Moffat. Goodbye. <laughs>